Hello, my name is Robert Gilday. I'm Professor Emeritus of Modern History at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of the British Academy. And today I'm going to talk about the minor strike of 1984 to 5. Now, I've been a historian of France for 40 years. Um, I always thought that British history was in black and white and that European history was in glorious technicolor. History of France in particular intrigued me, attracted me because it seemed to be based, it seemed to be about revolution, resistance, rebellion, but also about provincial France, La France Profonde. And then I thought one, one day, why don't I apply this to Britain? Why don't I look at something like the minor strike, where you can study both resistance and rebellion, if not revolution, uh, and also look at uh, provincial Britain, the Britain of the coalfields, La Grande Bretagne Profonde, if you like. Now, why does the minor strike matter? Maybe two reasons. You all know about the making of the working class, but this was the unmaking of the working class. It was the last great battle of the organised industrial class, of which the miners were the heroic vanguard. And they were fighting to defend their jobs against an aggressive policy of pit closures, which was designed to break the miners' union, the NUM. The miners were portrayed as the enemy within and the full force of the police the judiciary and the media was used to defeat them. Many miners finished up uh, in prison or uh, lost their jobs uh, and were sacked. The miners strike can also be seen as the beginning of the end of industrial Britain, the Britain of the Industrial Revolution, because the strike led to the closure of many pits, as, as, as the government intended. It led to the redundancy of miners and it led to the hollowing out of mining communities. And this has fed into accounts which have linked uh, left, so-called left behind regions to the, uh, the, the, the fact that many of these regions voted leave in the referendum campaign of 2016. But maybe there's a third story. Maybe there's a story that's not just about defeat and deindustrialization, but a more positive story is about, about how miners and their families reinvented themselves during and after the strike. Now this, for this study, I, I adopt, if you like, um, three lenses, the lens of class, the lens of community and the lens of family. Class, because as I said before, the miners were uh, seen to be the vanguard of the organised working class. They were after all the bringers of coal, which uh, fueled the Industrial Revolution. They were pitted against the elements, earth, air, fire and water. They were constantly at risk of death from earth falls, explosion, flood, mechanical accidents and also long term uh, lung disease. They were bound by camaraderie. They looked out for each other underground and they socialised above ground, drinking, playing rugby or football, womanising. Their labour was well organised to defend their wages, their jobs and their pensions uh, and to secure compensation in the event of uh, injury or um, accident or illness. And their ultimate, it, uh, the ultimate weapon was the strike and solidarity was based on the uh, the slogan, the mandate, the, the principle that one should never cross a picket line, one should never break a strike. In terms of community, we have to look at the pit village. Pit villages were always away from big town centres, uh, or they, that's where the pit was found, or they, or they could be the mining village where miners lived, although they travelled to other pits after their own pits had closed, and many were doing so from the 1960s. The miners' welfare uh, was a wonderful institution that existed at the centre of the mining village. It provided uh, trade union meeting rooms, a library, a reading room, a games hall and spaces for entertainment. And the community was very often seen to be self-policing. Women and children were kept on the safe and narrow. These communities were very often described by uh, people who lived in them as, as self-policing, they were described as close-knit. Uh, but even that, that close-knit element could be also quite oppressive. And if we look at families, mining was very often an, op uh, an occupation that was passed down from father to son. Many ex-miners said, oh my father didn't want me to go down the pit. But they had limited opportunities. They tended, they very often failed the 11 plus, uh, which you know was designed to produce, reproduce the existing class system. So they finished up uh, either in the factory or the pit. They had a kind of a, a very important masculinity. This was based on 
their ability as a breadwinner to earn a family wage, a wage that would keep the whole family going. It was based on their ability to defend that by, the, by strike action if necessary. And they were able to uh, exercise authority over uh, uh, the women in their family. There was quite a lot of promiscuity in some mining families. They, uh, they tended to um, uh, get pregnant at a, at a young age and then get married, but the obligation was always on the boy uh, to marry a, a girl in that position. After marriage, the women tended to stay at home, but increasingly uh, some of them worked in, in factories or shops or if they passed a little plus, in schools and offices. Now the minor strike was not a national strike. There was no national ballot on strike action, that was one of the big issues, and the action was really a series of strikes in different coal fields which had their own traditions and identities. The South Yorkshire coal field, for example, was the first to come out on strike, challenging other coal fields to follow. The Scottish coal fields were quite militant. The South Wales coal field was initially reluctant because the year before it had been let down by Yorkshire, when it, the South Wales, came out on strike, but eventually they came out. County Durham, Haverd, but came out. Nottinghamshire was split. Uh, most, of the, most, people, most miners in Nottinghamshire uh, insisted on a national ballot, and they were hostile to the invasion, as they saw it, of pickets from other coal fields who had come to picket them out. So in Nottinghamshire, a minority were on strike, the majority was opposed. Now during the strike, you, you see a sort of shift from class struggle to community struggle. The strike was orchestrated by the NUM, the Miners' Union, uh, which sent uh, miners to picket the pits in Nottinghamshire and other places where the, the miners were still working. They were also sent to picket power stations and ports to prevent the import and use of coal for energy. Although, of course, the government had cleverly stockpiled uh, imm immense, amount of, immense amounts of coal before provoking, provoking the strike. But after a month or two, it became clear that the strike was going to be long. So support groups were set up to raise funds, organise soup kitchens, provide food parcels to striking families. This meant a greater role for women who looked to feed their families and to defend their husbands' jobs on which the communities depended. And one of the, one of the slogans that came out during the strike was close a pit, kill a community. Connections, important connections were made uh, between mining communities and other trade unions, such as the printers and local government workers, but a good, a good number of unions uh, gave them the cold shoulder. So activist groups were also contacted, such as the Green and Common Women, and as you, as you will know from if you've seen the film Pride, uh, important contacts were made uh, between the South Wales miners and the Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners group in London and elsewhere. And increasingly links were made with trade unions abroad, Germany, France, Italy, Denmark, Sweden, the United States, in order to raise money. Now families and gender are very important in, this, in, in my study. The strike was a performance of masculinity. The miners switched from being heroic underground workers to heroic flying pickets. But it was also one of those famous crises of masculinity. The miners were no longer breadwinners, they didn't have a wage coming in, they were fighting a losing battle against the police. You've all seen the famous pictures of t-shirted men being chased by the cavalry at Orgreave in June 1984, and they saw themselves as no longer in control of their women. Because the women who wanted to defend their husbands' jobs, wanted to defend their families, came out uh, to, to, to get involved in themselves, as I said, raising money, uh, organising food parcels, but also standing on picket lines themselves because increasingly men were being arrested and were threatened with the sack if they were if they picketed. Now, was this feminism, or was this uh, a form of matriarchy that you might see in working class communities? How will we ever know? Well, one way to do this is actually to ask them, and this is why this is finally an oral history project, because what I wanted to know is what the strike meant to the men women and children who were involved in the strike as they look back on it today. And this has to be done by placing it in the context of their lives as a whole. So what I use uh, in my work is what's called the life history interview. I ask about their family of origin, uh, about uh, their schooling, relationships, marriage, ambitions and occupations, what they did during the strike and also then what they did after the strike. And what I'm interested in is how far women, how far men and women were, were, as it were, destroyed by the strike, but how far also they were able to reinvent themselves through 
education, pursuing different careers. Many, many went into careers like social work or probation work or teaching. They took up other forms of activism. Some became local councillors, some even became MPs. So this is a book which hopefully will see the light uh, in time for the 40th anniversary of the strike uh, in 2023, and the interviews will be uh, archived uh, at the British Library. Thank you.